Hey everybody, Tactic Angel, back on the PlayStation 5 to run down the history of the USS Independence, which appears in World of Warships Legends as a Tier 5 premium aircraft carrier. My review of Independence should follow shortly, and once it is available, you should see a link to it down in the description. As I talked about in a little more detail, or at least with more words, in the lead-up to the U.S. involvement in World War II, President Roosevelt was looking at the aircraft carrier fleet and figured that several more flat tops would be needed should the U.S. enter the global conflict. Though the U.S. had ordered 11 Essex-class carriers in 1940, none of them were expected to be in fighting condition until 1944. Thanks to some motivation provided by the Japanese Empire, some of these carriers would be available earlier, but following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the need for as much carrier deck space as possible, as soon as possible, became more acute. This led to nine Cleveland-class cruisers being reordered as carriers. Some of these cruisers had already been laid down. The lead ship of the class, the ship that would become USS Independence, started her life in May 1941, before the U.S. study concluded and before Pearl Harbor when she was laid down as the cruiser USS Amsterdam. Though the Navy had initially shot down the idea of operating smaller carriers, as they were less efficient than large carriers, required refuel and resupply more often, they were less capable of operations in poor weather, and experienced more accidents, a conversion design was hurriedly completed in February 1942. Following this, the Amsterdam was reordered in March. She was launched in August of the same year, and commissioned into service as then CV-22 USS Independence in January 1943. The conversion was intended to be quick, easy, but also functional. Below the deck line, these ships were very similar to Cleveland-class cruisers, to the point where the main battery magazines simply became bomb storage, and the most significant interior revisions were to redirect the exhaust stacks out the starboard side of the ship around the hangar. This maximized the number of aircraft that the Independence-class carriers could hold with its limited hangar space, which would usually be between 30 and 35 planes, about a third of the flight group you might find on a Yorktown or Essex-class fleet carrier. It was originally envisioned that Independence would carry nine torpedo bombers, nine dive bombers, and a dozen fighters. That plan was scrapped in favor of nine torpedo bombers and 24 fighters to help win the war in the sky. Following her commissioning, Independence spent a few months in shakedown and training in the Caribbean. She would then transfer to the Pacific through the Panama Canal and arrive in Pearl in July 1943. It was around this time that she gained the classification light carrier, and thus became CVL-22. Her first action in September 1943, she sailed alongside the first two ships of the Essex class. CV-9, USS Essex, and CV-10, the new USS Yorktown, in a very successful raid on Marcus Island, destroying over 70% of the installations located there. This was followed by additional attacks against Wake Island in October and Rabaul in November. Here, her AA gunners earned their first six kills, defending the ship and fleet. Then, after resupply, it was off to Tarawa to soften up the defenses for landings by the 2nd Marines, alongside Essex and the brand new Essex-class carrier, Bunker Hill. During the fighting off the Gilbert Islands, though, the Japanese launched a counterattack against the Southern Carrier Group. Independence was able to shoot down about six Japanese aircraft, but the planes launched at least five torpedoes in return. All but one of them missed, but Independence was struck in the starboard quarter. This would send Independence away from the fight for a while, first to Funafuti for temporary repairs and then back to San Francisco for something a little bit more permanent. In total, the repairs and upgrades would last for seven months. It was around this time that the U.S. Navy started to adopt the night fighting variant of the Grumman F-6F Hellcat, but the number of squadrons devoted to night fighting were very limited. On carriers with only one of these squadrons, they tended to end up participating in day rather than night operations. Instead of wasting the capabilities of night fighters during the day, the Navy decided to make all aircraft for, at first, one carrier, all night fighters. This carrier was USS Independence. Working back to combat readiness, she trained in July 1944 for a dedicated role as America's first night fighter. It sounds cool in retrospect, but in fact this honor was less exciting or interesting since there were relatively few big night operations. 
and aerial radar was often removed from these planes. That prevented valuable technology from being captured, but it also limited their effectiveness. Independence joined back with Task Force 38 and scored its first combat victory as a night fighter over the island of Samar in September, a Type 100 reconnaissance plane. But with limited nighttime targets, she reverted back to daylight operations, helping to repel Japanese counterattacks when Task Force 38 swung north to poke at Okinawa. By October, though, it was increasingly obvious that there was a storm brewing just over the horizon. This was going to be the Japanese fleet's last attempt to force a decisive battle, as they steamed most of their remaining fleet in three separate formations to try to split up the U.S. fleet and defeat them in decisive ship-to-ship -ship combat. Recon aircraft from Independence spotted Corita's center force as it sailed towards the Philippines through the Subian Sea. This allowed other elements of Task Force 38 to launch an attack on the fleet, which would sink Yamato's sister ship, Musashi, before she could really get into the fight. Believing Corita had turned back, Task Force 38 turned north, looking for the Japanese carrier force. This ultimately took the bulk of the fast battleships and fleet carriers out of range to help at the Battle of Samar, but again, Independence's nighttime recon proved useful as it spotted Ozawa's northern force. By this point, more distraction and prize than effective operational units, the combined flight group of Task Force 38's carriers T-posed all over the four carriers, morning, noon, and night until all of them were on their way to the bottom. Following the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the Japanese Navy was not much of a credible threat other than kamikazes, but this battle was significant to the Independence class as a whole because Independence' closest sister, the Princeton, was struck by a single Japanese D-4Y Judy dive bomber during the battle. The bomb landed pretty much dead center of the ship and exploded after penetrating through the deck in the hangar space. Though the damage from the bomb was fairly minor, something you might expect it to walk away from, it would start a series of fires. Fueled by aviation fuel, she never would recover. She suffered additional internal explosions believed to be one or more bombs within its magazine. After a six-hour fight to save the stricken carrier, the order was given to abandon ship and she was sent to the bottom by torpedoes. The battle for Leyte Gulf marked the high water mark for independence as a night fighter. She would continue to provide night recon and fighter protection through December, with just one week off for R&R. Independence had rejoined Task Force 38 when it sailed through Typhoon Cobra, losing two men who were swept overboard. And then she would join up with USS Enterprise in search of two of the last remaining Japanese battleships, Issei and Hyuga, which led to some of the final night operations of the war around Formosa in, in the South China Sea. Independence made for Pearl in January 1945 for repairs and would return to the operational theater in March to carry out attacks on Okinawa and provide fighter cover for the fleet, intercepting and destroying many desperate attacks by the remaining Japanese airmen. She would round out her service in World War II with a few attacks on the Japanese home island and recon locating prisoner of war camps. Following the surrender of Japan, she participated in Operation Magic Carpet, shuttling U.S. servicemen back to the mainland until January 1946. In total, Independence's air group shot down 101 aircraft, with Independence herself downing 12 more by AA fire. She would sink nine commercial vessels, the cruiser Oyota, and one destroyer. She would be decorated with eight battle stars for her service. But following the war, the U.S. ended up with a few more ships than it really needed. It certainly didn't require all 99 carriers that it had then in service, most of those being escort carriers, and the Independence was chosen as a test ship for the atom bomb tests at Bikini Atoll. Located 1.5 miles from the blast, she survived the explosion with notable damage to her superstructure and deformations of her hull, but other than a few leaks, she was in good enough shape to be towed to Pearl again and then San Francisco. Once the Navy had gleaned as much science from the ship as they could, she was towed off the coast of California and used as a target for weapons testing in January 1951. In all of the nine Independence-class carriers, eight survived the war, with Princeton being the only ship lost. Two ships were transferred to France following the war, the USS Balao Wood and Langley, with one more, USS Cabot, sold to Spain. The remainder were sold for scrap. The only remaining example of the class is the Independence herself, 
which rests at the bottom of the ocean near the Farallon Islands outside of San Francisco Bay at 37 degrees 30 minutes north by 123 degrees 5 minutes west. Photos of her wreck are available at several oceanographic websites, and all things considered being hit by an A-bomb and several more shells, she's in pretty good shape. And that pretty much finishes off the history of the independence. Once again, please check for my review in a couple days once it becomes available. Hope you've enjoyed this video, and as always, hope to see you on the next one.